welcome YouTubers to another episode in my Grammar Hero series. In today's video, I'm going to be working out 16 practice test questions that should closely mirror what you'll see in the mathematics knowledge subtest of both the Arm Services Vocational Aptitude Battery, that is the ASVAB, as well as the pre-screening internet delivered computer adaptive test, that is the PICAT. In order to get the most out of this video, you'll want to pause the video after I read a question, attempt to work out the question on your own, and then resume playing the video to check your solution. As a reminder, on the actual ASVAB and PICAT, you will not be permitted to use a calculator or reference sheet. So as you work your way through these practice test questions, try not to use any of those resources. Finally, I want to say this. Uh, it's impossible for me to cover all the variations of these questions in one video. And for that reason, I put together a free ASVAB slash PICAT math bootcamp playlist that includes more than 500 practice test questions. So if you're getting ready to take the ASVAB or PICAT soon, I strongly encourage you to go to this playlist and work through at least 10 of the videos. In doing so, you will be exceptionally well prepared for this test. And again, there will be no need for you to contact a tutor or to spend any amount of money on test prep resources. Of course, I'll put a link to my math bootcamp playlist in the description of this video. And on that note, let's go ahead and get started with these practice test questions. This uh, first question says, what is the product of the reciprocals of two thirds, one eighth and five? So before we can multiply our reciprocals of two thirds, one eighth and five, we first have to determine what those reciprocals are. Uh, so we're trying to find the reciprocal of two thirds, one eighth and five, according to this problem. Well, finding a reciprocal is very easy. You just exchange your numerator and your denominator. In other words, the reciprocal of uh, two thirds is three over two. Uh, let's do the same thing for one eighth to find its reciprocal. We're simply gonna exchange its numerator and denominator. In other words, the reciprocal of one eighth is eight over one. And finally, let's talk about how we're gonna find the reciprocal of five, which is a whole number. Uh, I can write five as a fraction by placing it over one. And in doing so, I can quickly find its reciprocal now by exchanging its numerator and its denominator. In other words, the reciprocal of five is one over five or one fifth. All right, so we found the reciprocals of two thirds, one eighth and five. And now this problem wants us to find the product of those reciprocals. And as you can see, I already set that up. Product of course means multiply. So in other words, we're gonna be multiplying all these fractions together. Thankfully enough, multiplying fractions is very simple and straightforward. You just multiply straight across. So in other words, this becomes three times eight times one in our numerator. And in our denominator, of course, we have two times one times five. All right, let's work this out. Uh, three times eight is 24. 24 times one is 24. Uh, two times one is, one, is two uh, times five is going to be 10. All right, so the product of the reciprocals of two thirds, one eighth and five is 24 over 10. Of course, that's not one of our answer choices, which means that there must be a way for us to reduce this fraction. As a matter of fact, you should recognize that this is an improper fraction, which means that the value of its numerator, 24, is bigger than the value of its denominator, notably 10. Uh, so let's go ahead and reduce this improper fraction, and then ultimately we're gonna convert it, as you can see from our answer choices, into a mixed number. So can we think of a number that goes both into 24 and 10? Of course, you should see that that is two. In other words, we can divide uh, 24 and 10 by two. 24 divided by two, of course, is 12. 10 divided by two is five. All right, so now that we've reduced that improper fraction, we're gonna have to convert it to a mixed number. And if you watched my video where I review fractions, 
you know that this is actually fairly easy to do. Uh, we just read this as long division. So I'm going to read this as 12 divided by 5. And by doing this long division, we'll be able to convert this improper fraction into a mixed number. Of course, we start this long division by asking ourselves, how many times does 5 go into 1? It doesn't. How many times does 5 go into 12 without going over? That's going to be 2 times. Given that 5 times 2 is 10, uh, 12 minus 10 is 2. And at this point, we have enough to write our mixed number. This 2 right here is going to be our whole number. This remainder of 2 is going to be the numerator in our fraction. And this 5 is going to be our denominator. So in other words, the product of the reciprocals of 2 thirds 1 eighth and 5 is A, 2 and 2 fifth. All right, so that is that one, a big test of your knowledge of fractions there. Number two says, what is the reciprocal of 3 and 1 fifth? So in this case, we want to find the reciprocal of the mixed number 3 and 1 fifth. Of course, in order to find reciprocals, we need a number expressed as a fraction, as you saw from the previous problem. So the first task here is to express 3 and 1 fifth as an improper fraction. And thankfully enough, that's pretty easy to do. Uh, our denominator of 5 is not going to change as we convert 3 and 1 fifth to an improper fraction. To write the numerator of our improper fraction, we do 3 times 5, which is 15, plus 1, which is 16. All right, so we wrote the equivalent improper fraction of 3 and 1 fifth. Now all we have to do is find the reciprocal. And as I mentioned in the previous problem, to find the reciprocal of a fraction, you just exchange your numerators and denominators. In other words, the reciprocal of 16 over 5 is 5 over 16. And just like that, uh, we are done with this one. All right, so uh, number three says, which of the following is not a prime number? And of course, we were given the numbers five. 3, 2, and 1. Well, as it happens, this is a bit of a trick question. Um, again, a number is considered prime if it only has two factors, notably one in itself. So the only factors are of 5 are 5 and 1. So we know 5 is prime. The only factors of 3 are 3 and 1. So we know that is prime. Similarly, the only factors of 2 are two and one, so we know that is prime. Well, if you haven't worked with uh, prime numbers in a long time, you simply just have to memorize the fact that one is never considered a prime number. Again, trick question. So the correct answer to this one is D. One is not a prime number. As a matter of fact, one is never a prime number. All right, so uh, number four says the coordinates of point A and point B are 2, 4, and negative 2, negative 4, respectively. What is the slope of the line that connects the two points? All right, so we're given the two points, notably 2, 4, as well as negative 2, negative 4. And we want to find the slope of the line that connects the two points. Well, in order to find the slope, we're going to need the slope formula, which is this m, which refers to slope, equals y2 minus y1 over x2 minus x1. Of course, this is one of the formulas on my reference sheet that you have to memorize. As a matter of fact, I think it's on the very first page of my free reference sheet. All right, so all we have to do is identify y1, x1, y2, x2 plug them in, and simplify accordingly. And if you haven't worked with slope in a long time, you may be wondering where we get those values from. Well, we get those values from our ordered pairs. Again, this is x1. That makes this y1. This is x2. That makes this y2. So with those identified, let's just go ahead and plug them in. We can see that y2 is negative 4, so that becomes negative 4. y1 is simply... Uh, four, so we'll plug that in accordingly. That's going to be over x2. x2 is right here. It's negative 2 minus x1, which is right there. It's 2. All right, let's simplify this now, and let me move down just a little bit so we can see the rest of this problem. We have negative 4 minus 
4. Negative 4 minus 4 is going to be negative 8. And then we have negative 2 minus 2. Negative 2 minus 2 is negative 4. All right, so we have negative 8 over negative 4. A negative divided by a negative is going to be a positive. Negative 8 divided by negative 4 is positive 2. So the slope of the line that connects the two points, 2, 4, and negative 2, negative 4 is B2. All right, so that is that one. Again, you have to memorize the formula to calculate slope. It's not that difficult. All right, so uh, number five says in the formula, C equals 5 ninths times F minus 32. If C equals 35, then what does F equal? All right, so the first thing I'm going to do is copy down this formula. And as you might imagine, C refers to Celsius. And F, of course, refers to Fahrenheit. Uh, according to this problem, we're told that C is 35. And we want to solve for F. All right, so in other words, we're going to be solving this equation that converts uh, Fahrenheit to Celsius for Fahrenheit. And the first thing I'm going to do, since I know C is equal to 35, is plug that in respectively. This becomes 35 equals 5 over 9 times F minus 32. Again, our goal is to solve this equation for F. In other words, we want to get F equal to something by itself. The first thing I want to do is get rid of this 5 ninths in front of this F uh, minus 32. And to get rid of it, we're going to multiply it by its reciprocal. You should know that the reciprocal of 5 ninths is simply 9 over 5. And we're going to multiply both sides of the equation by that to keep it balanced. This crosses out here and here, leaving you with just F minus 32 on this side. And now we got to take care of this over here. And I'm going to do this off to the side in case people haven't worked with these fractions in a long time. We have 9 over 5 times 35. That is to say, we're multiplying an improper fraction by a whole number. Well, to proceed, the first thing you want to do is rewrite this whole number 35 as a fraction by placing it over 1. And now, uh, to make this math a lot easier, we can simply cross-reduce. I can say, for instance, 5 goes into 5 one time, 5 goes into 35 seven times. So this becomes 9 over 1 times 7 over 1. 9 divided by 1, of course, is simply 9. 7 divided by 1, of course, is simply 7. So this reduces to 9 times 7. What is 9 times 7? You should know your uh, 7 times tables or your 9 times tables. Uh, 9 times 7 is 63. All right, so 9 fifths times 35 reduced to 63, as we saw thanks to this work over here. And now to get F by itself, we're simply going to add 32 to both sides of our equation. This crosses out here, leaving you with just F on this side. Let's do this math real quick, and I'm going to do it the old-fashioned way so as not to make any mistakes here. Uh, 3 plus 2 is 5. 6 plus 3 is 9. In math, it's customary to write the variable for which you solved on the left. So we can say F, or Fahrenheit, is 95. All right, so the answer to this one is D, 95. All right, so number six says, what is the expression 5 factorial equivalent to? Uh, the first thing I want to point out is we don't read this as exclamation point mathematics. That is a factorial symbol. And what it tells you to do is this. Let's say I gave you this. 3 factorial. That factorial symbol means this. It means take the number that you're given. So we're given the number 3 in this case. And we're going to multiply 3 by every number less than 3 until we get to 1. So that's going to be 3 times 2 times 1. If I gave you 4 factorial, we're going to take the number that we're given, notably 4, and we're going to multiply it by every number less than 4 until we get to 1. So that would be 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. And with that in mind, what do you think we do to evaluate the expression 5 factorial? Well, we take the number that we're given, notably 5, and we multiply it by every number less than 5 until we get to 1. 
So that's going to be 5 times 4 times 3 times 2 times 1. And as it happens, uh, all we're doing is multiplying all these numbers together. And thankfully enough, that's pretty easy to do. 5 times 4, you should know, is 20. 20 times 3 is 60. 60 times 2 is 120. And 120 times 1 is simply 120. Again, any number multiplied by 1 is just itself. So the correct answer to this one is C, 120. And just like that, you learned about factorials. Uh, you do not have to watch a long video about factorials because that's all there is to it. All right, so uh, number 7 here says if 25 equals 4x minus 7, then x equals so for this one, we're solving the equation 25 equals 4x minus 7 for x. In other words, we're getting x equal to something by itself. Uh, so in this case, we're going to work on rearranging uh, numbers and variables in this equation until we get x by itself. The first thing you want to do is add 7 to both sides. That crosses out there, leaving you with just 4x on this side. What is 25 plus 7? If you can't do that in your head, there's no shame in using your hands to do so. 25, 26, 27, 28, 29, 30, 31, 32. All right, so we're left with 32 equals 4x. Again, we want to get rid of that 4 in front of the x, so we're going to divide both sides by 4. This crosses out here and here, leaving you with x on this side. 32 divided by 4, you should know that from your times tables, it's 8. And in math, it's customary to write the variable for which you solved on the left. So we're going to write x equals 8. Uh, so the correct answer to this one is b. All right, so number 8 says, what are the factors of x squared plus 4x plus 3? In other words, we're trying to factor x squared plus 4x plus 3. You should recognize that this is a quadratic equation that has a leading coefficient of 1. So if we can factor it, it's going to look like this, x times x. All right, so now we're looking for two factors that multiply to 3 but add to positive 4. Uh, so what are those going to be? Well, we have two options. We have negative 3 times negative 1. Negative 3 times negative 1 is positive 3. Negative 3 plus negative 1 is negative 4. We need a positive 4, uh, so those don't work. Our only other option is 3 and 1. Again, 3 times 1 is 3. 3 plus 1 is, in fact, 4, so those are going to be our two factors. So this is going to be x plus 3, x plus 1. And we should see that that is answer choice C in this case. All right, so number 9 says, what is 8b? minus AB plus 7A, subtract it from 3A minus 9AB plus B. So uh, in this case, we're going to be subtracting polynomials. And in case you don't know what a polynomial is, it's just a group of uh, letter variables and numbers. So this 8B minus AB plus 7A is one poly and I'm not the best speller here, so if I misspelled that, don't count it against me. And this 3a minus 9ab plus b is our second polynomial. And as it happens, subtracting polynomials is usually more difficult than adding polynomials. And let me explain why. And I'm going to solve this problem two ways to show you that uh, you have to be careful when you subtract polynomials. Well, the first thing I'm going to do before I set up the subtraction is this. If we look at our answer choices, we can see they're written like this. A, A, B, B. A, A, B, B. A, A, B, B. So we want to work with these polynomials in that order. Well, we can see this polynomial has that order. A, A, B, B. This one's B, A, B, A. So the first thing I'm going to do is just rewrite this to mirror this polynomial as well as our answers. So let's rewrite this. It's going to be 7a minus ab plus 8b. All right. That is the same polynomial as that one. I just swap my a's and my b's very quickly, the positions of them. 
All right. Now let's go and work on this subtraction. It says we're subtracting this polynomial from this polynomial. So that's going to look like this. And here's how I'm going to do it. The first way, we have 3a minus 9ab plus b. And from that, we're subtracting this entire second polynomial. So we have to put that entire second polynomial in parentheses like that, such that it looks like this, minus 7a minus ab plus 8b. If you do not do that, you will get this question wrong. And as I said, when I show you the second way to solve this one, you'll see why that's the case. All right, so the first thing we have to do now is uh, take this negative and distribute it here, here, and also here. So let's work on doing that. Again, this first part is not going to change. 3a minus 9ab plus b. Negative times positive 7a becomes negative 7a. Negative times negative ab. A negative times a negative is a positive. So this becomes positive ab. And then negative times positive ab becomes negative 8b. Again, a negative times a positive is a negative. Now that we've distributed that negative, which you have to do in order to get this one correct, all we're going to do is combine like terms. Like terms have the same letter variables raised to the same powers. Uh, so right here, I have 3a. We have a raised to the first power. So we're looking for its corresponding like term. It's right here, negative 7a. 3a minus 7a is negative 4a. Uh, now that we've combined those like terms, we can go ahead and cross them out. Next, we have uh, negative 9ab. Next, we have negative 9ab plus ab. And if it's helpful, you can put a 1 in front of that ab. Negative 9ab plus 1ab is going to be negative 8ab. Now that we've combined those, we can cross them out. And then finally, we have b minus 8b. b minus 8b is negative 7b. All right, so when we subtract 8b minus ab plus 7a from 3a minus 9ab plus b, the result is negative 4a minus 8ab minus 7b, which is d. All right, let me solve this a second way to finally prove to you that this is how you subtract polynomials. There is no other way to do it. And ask yourself this, who are you going to believe? Someone who gets close to perfect scores and on their standardized test? Or are you going to believe someone who probably got an average score on this test? All right, so with that said, let's take a look at the second way to solve this one. And you do it like this. Again, we're subtracting this polynomial from this polynomial. So we have 3a minus 9ab plus b. And from that, we're subtracting this second polynomial. And let's go ahead and do that. That's going to be minus 7a minus ab plus 8b. All right, so I just copied all those terms down directly under this first polynomial. And you can see I'm subtracting them. Well, this says 3a minus 7a. 3a minus 7a is negative 4a. This says negative 9ab minus negative ab. Well, minus minus becomes a plus. So this is the same thing as negative 9ab plus ab, which is going to be negative 8ab. And then finally, we have b minus 8b. Well, b minus 8b is negative 7b. So regardless of how you solve this one, you get the same result. And because of that, I know my solution is 100% correct. All right, so number 10 says, what is the sum of 3x to the third minus 2x plus 8? 2x squared plus 5x and x to the third plus 2x squared minus 3x minus 3. Well, in this case, we're finding the sum of three different polynomials. And if it's helpful, 
I can go ahead and point out that this is one of our poly polynomials. This is our other polynomial. And this is our third polynomial. Uh, adding polynomials, unlike subtracting polynomials, is very simple and straightforward. You just line them up and combine like terms. So that's going to look like this. 3x to the third minus 2x plus 8 plus 2x squared plus 5x plus x to the third plus 2x squared minus 3x minus 3. All right, so we just added all of those polynomials together. The signs do not change since we're just doing basic addition here. Uh, that said, all we have to do is go through this long expression here and combine our like terms. Again, what are like terms? Like terms have the same letter variables raised to the same power. So in this case, we have the letter variable x raised to the third power. Its corresponding like term is going to have the letter variable x raised to the third power. Let's scan through this expression. Right there, you can see we have x to the third power. And if it's helpful, you can place a one in front of that. 3x squared plus one x, or 3x to the third plus one x to the third is going to be four x to the third. Now that I've combined those two like terms, I can go ahead and cross them out. Um, as you write your answer, you want your powers uh, to go from greatest to least. Uh, so you can see that we're starting with x to the third. Next, I'm going to write x squared. So let's look at this uh, 2x squared right here. Again, we have the letter variable x raised to the second power. Its corresponding like term is going to have the letter variable x raised to the second power. And we can see that that is right there. 2x squared plus 2x squared is simply 4x squared. Now that I've combined those, I can go ahead and cross them out. Of course, uh, the next letter variable with the highest power is simply x to the first. So we're going to be combining negative 2x, 5x, and negative 3x. Um, negative 2x plus 5x is 3x. 3x minus 3x is 0. So our letter variable x simply goes to zero. So we don't have to write in plus zero here. And then finally, we have eight minus three. Eight minus three is simply five. All right, so the answer to this one is four x to the third plus four x squared plus five, which is answer choice D. All right, so number 11 says, what is the area of a triangle with a base of 12 inches and a height of eight inches? So for this problem, we're trying to find the area of a triangle. Uh, for that reason, you have to know this formula. Area of a triangle is found by multiplying one half times the base and height of the triangle. In other words, area equals one half base times height. All right, we know what those values are. We're told that the base of this triangle is 12 inches and the height of this triangle is eight inches. So let's plug those in and simplify respectively. This becomes area equals one half, uh, the base of our triangle is 12. So this becomes one half times 12. The height of our triangle is eight. So this becomes times eight. You should know that one half times 12 is six. So this becomes uh, one half times 12, which becomes six times eight. And six times eight is 48. Of course, this is gonna be inches squared since we're talking about area. All right, so the area of a triangle with a base of 12 inches and a height of 8 inches is C, 48 inches squared. Number 12 says, what is the product of A minus 1 and uh, 2A plus 2? Believe it or not, A minus 1 is a polynomial. And 2A plus 2 is another polynomial. So in this case, we're finding the product of two polynomials. If you need help doing this, I have a video that's about an hour long. And in that video, I discuss how to multiply polynomials. That said, all we're doing is this, a minus one times two a plus two. Now, some people like to expand this using the FOIL method. With that said, we're just using the distributive property. So uh, regardless of how you think about that, this is how we're going to proceed. We're going to take this first term, notably a, 
and we're going to multiply it here as well as here. Then we're going to take this second term, notably negative 1, and we're going to multiply it here as well as here. So let's go ahead and work on doing that. We have a times 2a. a times 2a is going to be 2a squared. Then we have a times 2. That's just going to be plus 2a. Then we have negative 1 times 2a. Negative 1 times 2a is negative 2a. And then finally, we have negative 1 times positive 2. Negative times a positive is a negative. So that's negative 2. All right, that's not one of our answer choices because we can simplify this uh, by combining like terms. This reduces to 2a squared. 2a minus 2a goes to 0. We don't write 0 in our expressions like that. So this just simply goes away, and we're left with 2a squared minus 2, which you can see is answer choice C. All right, so number 13 says if x plus 3y equals 7 and y equals 2, then x equals. So we're given this equation, x plus 3y equals 7. In addition, we were told that y equals 2, and we want to solve this equation for x. In other words, we want to get x equal to something by itself. So the first thing I'm going to do is substitute 2 in for y. So this becomes x plus 3 times, we know y is 2 according to the problem, equals 7. All right, this becomes x plus 3 times 2 is 6 equals 7. And again, according to the problem, we want to solve for x. In other words, we want to get x equal to something by itself. In this case, it's going to take one step to do that. Notably, we're simply going to subtract 6 from both sides. This becomes x equals 7 minus 6, which is 1. All right, so that is that one. Uh, the correct answer is A, 1. All right, so uh, number 14 says, what is the value of 3x plus 5y when x equals 12 and y equals 4? So we're given this expression, 3x plus 5y. And what's more, we're told that x equals 12 and y equals 4. In other words, we want to know what this value of this expression is when we plug in 12 for x and 4 for y. So let's go ahead and do that. This becomes 3 times 12 plus 5 times. We know y is 4. Now, some of you aren't pretty good with your times tables, so it's okay on the test to work this off to the side. We have 12 times 3 like that. Uh, 2 times 3 is 6. 3 times 1 is 3. So this is 36 plus 5 times 4, which is 20. Again, I know on test day, some of you are going to be nervous, and you might not be able to do that in your head confidently. Uh, so you can always do that off to the side as well. 6 plus 0 is 6. 3 plus 2 is 5. All right, so what is the value of 3x plus 5y when x equals 12 and y equals 4? As you just saw, that is 56. All right, pretty simple problem there. You just have to know how to multiply with 12s. Uh, if you don't know, have those memorized already. All right, so number 15 says the hypotenuse of a right triangle has a length of 14 units and a side that is 9 units long. Which equation can be used to find the length of the remaining side? All right, so we're told that we're working with a right triangle. So let's quickly draw one of those as best we can. This is our right angle, of course. And in addition, we were told that our triangle has a hypotenuse that is 14 units. Well, how do you identify a hypotenuse in a right triangle? Hypotenuse is always directly across from your right angle. So I know this side right here is going to be 14 units since it is my hypotenuse. And in addition, we were told that one of the sides of this right triangle is 9 units long. Of course, the question did not specify which of those sides was nine units. So in light of that, you get to pick which side you want to label nine units. I'm just going to call this side right here nine units. And we want to know uh, the length of the remaining side. Well, in mathematics, uh, you can typically represent unknown values with letter variables. Uh, so in this case, I'm going to represent the length of this unknown side of this right triangle with the letter variable x. All right, so now that we have a quick diagram sketched, 
we're also going to have to use the Pythagorean theorem uh, to figure this one out. The Pythagorean theorem says this, a squared plus b squared equals c squared, where a and b refer to the legs of the right triangle and c refers to the length of the hypotenuse of the right triangle. All right. And uh, of course, this is a formula that you have to memorize since it's on my reference sheet. And the way it works is like this. If you know at least two of these variables, you can figure out the third one fairly easily. In other words, if you know A and B, you can figure out C. If you know A and C, you can figure out B. And if you know B and C, you can figure out what A is. Well, in this case, we know C is our hypotenuse and we know C is 14. Uh, what's more, we know one of these legs of the right triangle is nine units. So I'm gonna say A is nine. And that means B is our missing side. So I'm gonna let B equal X. All right, let's plug things in now. I know I said A is nine, so this becomes nine squared plus, I said B was X, so this becomes X squared equals uh, C, which is 14. So this is 14 squared. Now we're just gonna be solving the Pythagorean theorem for X. And if you look at our answer choices, you can see that they didn't even solve it for X. They just left it as X squared. So that's really all we have to do. Uh, in other words, we have to just get X squared equal to something by itself. And that's very, very simple to do. We're gonna subtract nine squared from both sides of this equation to keep it balanced. This crosses out here, leaving you with just X squared on this side. We can see X squared is equal to 14 squared minus nine squared. All right, so that is that one. And we can see that the correct answer choice is C in this case. Again, you have to memorize the Pythagorean theorem. And above all else, you have to understand how to work with right triangles. All right, finally, number 16 says, if 4X squared equals 16, then what does X equal? So we're trying to solve this equation, 4X squared equals 16 for X which means ultimately we want to get X equal to something by itself. Uh, the first thing we can do to get X squared by itself is to divide both sides of this equation by four. This crosses out, leaving you with X squared on this side. Um, 16 divided by four, of course, is four. So we have X squared equaling four, but according to the problem, we just want X equal to something by itself. To get rid of this square, I'm gonna take the square root of both sides. This crosses out, leaving you with just X over here. Uh, the square root of four, you should know is two. So the correct answer to this one is D two. All right, so that is it for this video. As you just saw, none of the problems were very difficult at all. And for that reason, I don't recommend that you spend any money on expensive test prep resources or tutoring. Again, even time is money. So if you understood 80 to 90% of the stuff in this video, you're gonna be good to go on test day. Do not waste your time uh, with those tutors telling you that this test is hard. All right, so again, I hope you found this video helpful. As usual, you're more than welcome to leave feedback in the comments section below. If you wanna help my channel out, you can do one of two things. Uh, you can of course subscribe to my channel if you haven't done so already. And you can also share links to my videos, including this one on social media, including on Facebook and Twitter. And on that note, I'm gonna go ahead and catch you loose. Konnichiwa.